Gators on three. One, two, three, Gators! Welcome to Ontario schools of the 21st century and to a world of astonishing diversity. This introduction to the equity and inclusive education policy will take you on a journey that brings to life an equitable and inclusive education system where all students, parents and other members of the school community are welcomed and respected. Every student is supported and inspired to success in a culture of high expectations for learning. On this journey you will get a clear understanding of the essential elements of Ontario's equity and inclusive education strategy Experience how schools in Ontario today are already putting these elements into practice. Find approaches and practices that you can readily adapt to your school environment. Through this video we will explore the eight focus areas that support an equitable and inclusive education environment. These will be built into the equity and inclusive education policy you will have in place. They are effective board policies, programs, guidelines, and practices that serve staff, students, and families in diverse communities. Shared and committed leadership that recognizes the perspectives and experiences of all students and meet their needs. School community relationships that involve all members of the school community. Inclusive curriculum and assessment practices that address biases and support each student in maximizing her or his learning potential. Religious accommodations for staff and students that respect the individual's rights to follow or not follow her or his religious beliefs and practices. A respectful, positive school climate and learning environment free from discrimination and harassment. Professional learning to support all voices. Accountability and transparency through open reporting on goals and progress. Well, to ensure effective implementation of an equity policy, trustees should first engage in a conversation with the community to ensure that they fully understand what is needed in the board. They need to make sure that they are completely uh, in, in alliance with the policy, in understanding what the policy will mean for the school board. Well, I think the idea of equity and diversity, I think the philosophy of it, everyone embraces. I think that school boards, no doubt, teachers, no doubt, all really support this initiative. But I think more importantly, what we need to see is a bit more action and execution of this philosophy that we have. Um, I think we have to take more of a forward stance with equity and inclusion, ensuring that students feel like they're safe rather than just seeing it on paper. I think that means more events. I think that means more um, discussion. I think that needs more um, just a general attitude. I think that teachers and students need to adopt, uh, which is just an attitude of universality, I think. On parlait euh, du conseil, euh, des conseillers scolaires et de leur pouvoir relatif. Euh, les conseillers scolaires ont un certain pouvoir, vraiment, euh, ils, ont, ils sont à la table, ils prennent des décisions importantes, mais ils pourraient prendre encore des décisions plus importantes pour notre société si on les consultait un peu plus avant de lancer des politiques et euh, surtout aussi les administrations scolaires euh, s'ils sont concernés et consultés avant de, de lancer ces politiques. Les boards ont été très efficaces en établissant des comités d'équité pour assurer que la policy est being implemented correctement. They have community partners at the table, and there's a full alignment between the policy and the initiatives uh, that support student achievement. An inclusive uh, school board really is about equal access to the benefits uh, that we have to offer. And uh, I think we have to constantly remember that that may require differentiated treatment. But what we're trying to do is improve the performance of our students, prepare them for what they're going to face when they leave us. And we know we can't do that alone. So to uh, engage uh, our parents is critical to our success. In terms of success in implementation of equity and diversity, I, I think there's a certain amount that you can you can uh, you can judge by by walking around. Just observing what you see in a, in, a, in a school is a very powerful tool. However, I also think you absolutely have to gather data in other ways as well. Um, uh, we find it uh, very effective to have regular surveys, regular focus groups with our parents and with our staff and with our students to ensure that we um, are hearing from them, from their many voices. 
The Ministry of Education requires that each school board in Ontario appoint a Special Education Advisory Committee, or SEAC. SEAC is a committee of the board that advises and makes recommendations to the board on special education programs and services. Membership includes school trustees and representatives from local community associations groups that represent exceptional children, and may include additional members. SEACs play a vital role in the success of special education programs and services in Ontario's publicly funded schools. The Parent Involvement Committees, or PICs, are parent-led committees that provide advice to local school boards and offer an important link between parents and the school board's Director of Education and elected trustees. The purpose of PIC is to support and actively encourage meaningful parent engagement to support student achievement and well-being. PICs enhance parent engagement by providing information and advice to the district school board on parent engagement and communicating with parents. Developing strategies and initiatives the board could use to engage more parents to support their children's learning at home and at school. Sharing information with and supporting the work of school councils. We encourage as a PIC committee that schools let parents know about the volunteer opportunities in the school and to invite parents to come and help. The idea is that parents who are involved with their children, that their children are more successful at school. And the provincial parent engagement policy is all around that. And PIC committees want to look at things that they can do to bring parents in to the school board at a number of levels, either sitting on board committees or running, helping to run symposiums for parents or professional developments and to support school councils. The SEACs are a, a wonderful uh, body that exists in every school board. Uh, they're, they're parents uh, who know their children and often their children have uh, special needs or the SEAC members belong uh, to groups and organizations uh, that advocate for, for children with special needs. So you can imagine uh, that group of people uh, coming together and the, the wealth of experience and knowledge that they have. And so they should be consulted. Conversations like this one are taking place in school boards across the province. You will see how planning for implementation involves many of the areas of focus we have just looked at. What will be the best way for us to demonstrate some of the best practices we've got going on in our board? It's a combination of things. I think one, we do uh, a lot of media publications. We use the communications department for that. We also think when people express concerns or disappointments that we can actually show that we're working actively to resolve those issues to some of those concerns that they've expressed to the board and to the schools. I believe two school boards should share some of their best practices because collectively we can do a whole lot and a lot of things, great things are happening across the province but it's important for other boards to know what's happening and how they can bring some of those strategies back to the local level and impact what they're doing in their work in the area of equity and diversity. And I think there's a lot of networking that's happening at the regional level and at the provincial level and I think if boards tap into that networking uh, sessions and networking groups, it can actually enhance what they're doing because they get to share their best practices at the same time learn what other boards are doing and incorporate some of the other best practices that are happening across the province. Leaders come from every part of the school community and their voices are a powerful force in inspiring practices and behaviors that make our schools welcoming, equitable and inclusive places for everyone. Student leaders are a particular force of positive energy. A lot of the activities that we do at our school allows the students and the teachers to come together and we basically collaborate. So I'm an art student and I like to do things that, you know, geared towards social justice. One of the activities, for example, was a book club that we had at our school where students and teachers came together and we selected a series of books that we would read throughout the year and we would meet once a month and discuss the books, what we learned from them and whether or not they would be appropriate to implement for different students within our school. So it gave students an opportunity to listen to teachers' perspectives and vice versa as well. A really important aspect of the school is that it goes beyond social academia. When I say that, I feel as if when we even step into the school, um, the very first steps that we take into the school, we feel very comfortable right away, um, simply because um, teachers don't just inspire us to be better as students, but they also inspire us to be better as human beings. 
And, and with that being said, they give us the opportunity to do much more with our lives once we even leave the school as graduates to do bigger things, to contribute to the world in some way, um, whether that's with social activism or volunteering, so on and so forth. We use the concept of big ideas. In grade eight um, this year, we've chosen the first term was global citizens, and then we moved into voice of change, and then we moved into making the world aware. So as part of voice of change, all of the grade sevens and grade eights got to go to the movie theater and watch the movie Invictus. And really the theme behind the movie was how one person can make a change. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And we really wanted the grade eight students to get the idea that they can make a difference. From there, we moved into um, writing editorials. And as you can see on the board in the back, there is a great amount of diversity in the editorial topics. We allow the students the opportunity to choose their editorial. We have everything from Xbox is better than PS3s to um, the abuse of animals and should we have school dances or school trips anymore. So very, very diverse, um, but it was the student's voice. Les élèves se sentent engagés. Pourquoi? Parce que tout le monde est engagé dans l'école et parce qu'ils se sentent engagés, ils, euh, ils sont fiers d'être ici et ils veulent réussir. Ils sont fiers de faire des projets, de faire de belles activités et ils veulent, euh, ils veulent réussir. Ils veulent euh, donner leur maximum puis ils sont capables et on est là pour les aider à atteindre leur succès. So the Global Issues Club started last year and the idea of the Global Issues Club really is just as a space for students who are interested to come out and think about and talk about what is a global issue, um, what are things around the world that we think about that maybe concern us sometimes and what can we do to make a difference in those issues right here in our own community. I think everyone realizes that it's a no-risk environment, that every opinion is valued. And so while we may share some of the same values, we may have differences of opinion, but that those are respected by each other because we come from a very diverse backgrounds ourselves, right, as students. And the best part is that uh, we have three focuses, right? We have action, we have education, we have raising awareness. And the best thing about the Global Issues is that we can actually, we have a process with every project. We always reflect after every project, like we're doing with the Haitian milk bags. We're still mm -hmm. reflecting on that because we learned a lot from that project. And our trips at uh, Young Street Mission, for example, in Toronto and in, um, at the Holocaust Museum in Toronto, that helped a lot. Ontario is a vibrant province and our school communities are rich in diversity. Not all parent communities are comfortable in getting involved with the local school and it is critical that the school reaches out to the parents of all the students they serve. It's absolutely critical in my view to see parent engagement as the means to the ultimate end. The ultimate end is student achievement and student well-being. And I believe that that's really enriched the relationship between educators and parents and the public uh, because they understand that it's not attendance at school council meetings or not attendance at the parent-teacher interview that is uh, the ultimate outcome. It's in fact through those uh, strategies that we will uh, support one another in, in ensuring that our students are successful in the long run. In my work as the Equity and Inclusive Education Coordinator, uh, we really feel that the building capacity around what we call cultural proficiency, and we, we use that term cultural proficiency in, in the big broad sense of culture, that it's really about serving any socio-economic kind of group, not just newcomer groups, um, but any equity-seeking marginalized group of people. And um, of course, Along with that comes a lot of dialogue and discussion through um, professional learning for staff, also making sure that um, our, our outside agencies that we are engaging to help us with that work is um, that there's a lot of good collaboration and cooperation between the school staff and, for example, the settlement workers. Settlement workers are important because when the newcomers land in Canada, they have many type of challenges which they face with. Uh, the first one is the language is a basic barrier they have. If the language is not a barrier, then there are economic barriers. There are many other issues which are going through, like the education system is different. They don't know education system. Then when they go to the school, they don't know what if, uh, they are expected to 
there's a lot of things with it which they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the settlement worker is the person who can come there and help them to settle down and explain what is expected from them. We have made a really concerted effort to make sure that those settlement workers are not seen as outside staff. We spent an awful lot of time really building the foundation by asking those teams of school staff to work together with the settlement worker to kind of co-construct their understanding of what it means to be a settlement worker in the schools and how their work was going to look, what their role was going to look like, and what were going to be the effective strategies that they were going to employ together to engage staff. And I think for some of our parents too, school is unfamiliar. They may have not gone to school in a big building like this one. Mm -hmm. So opening up the doors yeah. is, is an important step. And parent council has been key to that. I think your involvement has been a wonderful way of inviting the different groups that we have within our school onto council, communicating with them about what the school's all about. I think that is one of the ways that we allow parents to come in to help. Not everybody can be on parent council, perhaps, but some can come and tie skates, some can read stories to kids, one might work as a translator. So it's finding different ways, isn't it, to um, allow parents to become involved in the community. Interconnect, yeah. Stay yes, in interconnect, yeah. yeah. One of the things that school councils can do is talk about what does a school look like when you first enter it. Um, so they may put um, or suggest to work with the principal on a welcome package for parents because that is their first time into the school. When they walk up and it might be at junior kindergarten registration time, but it might be at another time in their child's life where they've moved and they're coming into um, any other grade. So if the school has sort of a standard package that they give any new parent, and that could include, you know, a welcome letter from the principal, could include things in the community besides the school that um, are available to parents, such as community centers or public health, housing help or anything like that. You could do an information night in June so that um, with the junior kindergarten or senior kindergarten teachers so that the parents get an idea of what they should show up um, with in, this, in the fall with their son or daughter. Backpack, um, what kind of snacks the schools want them to bring. Um, and then again, they could have another information night into September. Um, and this is three times now that the parent would be uh, welcomed in the school. And the school council can be instrumental in, in setting up the types of things that would be best for their school community. In many boards, the challenge is to build respectful mutual relationships with the diversity of unique First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities in our province. When I first came to like cities and towns, I uh, spoke my own language and everybody spoke our language. And then I came here and had to learn a whole new way, you know, and even in the schools, like my accent, they, they wanted to, uh, to teach me English better. Now we're in a day and an age where it's very important for us to be diverse and learn, learn new things. Song in my culture is, is very important. It's like the very center of who we are. So if I can teach these young people a song, and, in our language and teach them some of the meanings. You know, uh, I, I can't even imagine what kind of workers we'll have in, in the future when these people have that kind of knowledge. These guys, when they come into workplace, they'll understand because they were part of it. And I think that it'll go a long ways in our search for, you know, peace and understanding within our, our cultures. Boards and their schools use inclusive curriculum and assessment practices and effective instructional strategies that reflect the diverse needs of all students and the learning pathways that they are taking. Schools provide students and staff with authentic and relevant opportunities to learn about diverse histories, cultures and perspectives. Students should be able to see themselves represented in the curriculum, programs and culture of the school. I think what we'll do is we'll do a community circle 
Talk about the things that you do at this school, the things that you do in this class, in this room and outside, that um, create a community and show how we look after ourselves and look after one another. Turn to the person next to you. We have seen my decline in action by doing assemblies to talk about different things like beliefs and differences. Mm -hmm. Look after yourself and look after one another, which yeah. means no matter what, it's not always looking out for you. Yeah. We believe truly that we can support our students in many different ways to make them the best they can be as lifelong learners. So to start some of that process was to create some framework around that. And so our school goals at our school now are do your job, be kind, and get involved. And get involved is a really important part of making this school a better place. And getting involved doesn't just mean student involvement, it also means teacher involvement. Being different, is that a good thing or a bad thing? All together. A good thing. That's a great thing. I feel comfortable because my friends me and the teachers are really nice. They help me if I have problems. And then... Yeah, it's for working. We are not always alone. We are always together with a group to communicate and to be together and to be together and not to feel like you're always alone. The overarching theme of social justice and equity is the idea of window and mirror. That the curriculum should reflect uh, what the students' experiences are, um, and they should see their experiences reflected back to them. It's not just the textbooks that is a curriculum, but all over the classroom, all over the school, that is a curriculum as well. And what we see, what we do, what we say, and what we don't say should reflect uh, the experiences and affirm the experiences of our students. One of our grade 12s now have a legacy project. So what they have done, it's Helping Hands for Honduras, and so the graduating class does fundraising and there's a teacher sponsor. And what they do is that they sponsor a young girl or young boy in Honduras to assist them with their schooling, their food, and taking care of them. And one of our staff then goes and has a connection actually to this orphanage. She travels and then takes all of the things that either we've bought or gathered and takes them to Honduras. And the kids now, we sort of have a pen pal, the kids write back to us. And so our kids are connected even once they leave through our website. So it's a living legacy. And again, it speaks to our kids um, how empathetic they are and compassionate. And they truly, certainly within this school, they they find that um, caring about others is fundamental and it makes us better individuals and for them scholastically the school is does extremely well so it goes hand in hand one isn't without the other within my own curriculum I ensure that my classroom reflects the diversity that I see with, within my students so that might range from posters that represent women, posters that represent individuals from different backgrounds. You know, it also reflects the books that I'm giving to my students. So my students see themselves reflected in the material that they're learning about. I ensure that within my own teaching, uh, students can identify with the different experiences that I'm talking about. So that might in include me um, bringing in examples from outside the mainstream um, curriculum so you know sometimes I might have to go and look for alternative magazines or readings from um, different parts of the world that do apply to my students so that they also can relate to what they're learning about. What we do in our literacy program is we follow pathways and we decide on a cluster of expectations that the kids are going to be working on and we do that under an umbrella so um, we've talked about accepting differences we've talked about making choices uh, and one of the things when we were doing Making Choices, we talked about was a study of residential schools. So we read books like Shinshi's Canoe and Shishi Uh We did a biography of a residential school survivor, and that's also when we had a guest speaker come in. And I leave the things posted around the room because the kids are really able to connect then 
to the ideas we see in other books. We always activate our schema. We talk a lot about leadership. We talk about qualities of leaders in making choices. Um, and we, not, we don't only focus on Aboriginal perspectives as well. We've talked uh, quite a bit about Martin Luther King this year, and the kids have related that back to residential schools, wondering what he would have done and what would he have said. So it really brings it all together for them and leaving it posted around the room is a really powerful way for the kids to connect with what we're doing with what we've already done. Inclusion is not something we do for someone. It's not for the benefit of an individual. It's for the benefit of everyone. Uh, we can learn uh, from others as much as they can learn for us and there's very valuable lessons in including children with, with special needs. The individual education plan is something that parents and educators and when appropriate students can review on an ongoing basis and they can help measure their progress through it and adapt it and, and change it as uh, necessary. It should be a, a living document. It's uh, a way of leveling the playing field for kids with special needs. But beyond that, it's a wonderful mechanism for the students and the parents and the educators to, to work together and come to an understanding of how they are going to accommodate and if necessary uh, modify the programs for students and ensure that their inclusion in all activities that make sense for them to be involved in uh, occurs. A tip for any educator is to understand that student achievement and student identity go hand in hand. You cannot motivate a child you don't know. You cannot teach a child you don't respect. And for many of our students, their home life is virtually linked to their identity. And if you don't acknowledge who they are and where they come from, they can't do well in school. Students learn best uh, when their environment, uh, both at home and at school, is uh, well suited to them. That they feel uh, that their needs are being met but also that their interests are being met. So it, it's important to keep in mind as students and as uh, parents and as educators that uh, children all learn at, at different paces and uh, that we've, we've learned uh, through documents like uh, Learning for All that uh, differentiated instruction uh, is important in every classroom. So we're going to keep working on making text-to-text -text connections and you have two texts in front of you. We're going to use Brother Eagle, Sister Sky and then you also have the lyrics to Big Yellow Taxi by Joni Mitchell. So before we start, let's just review why do we make text-to-text -text connections? Who knows? Nathan? Um, I try whenever I can to incorporate different perspectives in the curriculum, especially Aboriginal perspectives because I do have over 50% of my students are Aboriginal. But we try really hard to do it um, very embedded in the curriculum. Today when we did our lesson with the song versus the book, it's not held up as here's an Aboriginal book that we're doing. It's just a text that we're doing. We practice all of our strategies, but at the same time it allows the kids to see themselves in the curriculum, to see their culture reflected and a variety of perspectives presented. Let's talk a little bit about audience and the main ideas. So, who do you think that Chief Seattle is speaking to in Brother Eagle, Sister Sky? What do you think, Nathan? Um, the people who um, are trying to buy the land. Okay, and what is he telling them? Um, that if they buy the land um, to like take as good care as, um, to it as they did. Okay, and what about Joni Mitchell in Big Yellow Taxi? Who's she singing to? Who's she talking to? I think that it really works to make the kids critical thinkers. What my hope is, is that I'm preparing them to be um, caring and considerate citizens of the world. So I want them to think about equity. I want them to think about the environment. I want them to uh, not only think about it, but do something about it. So I feel like by adding different perspectives into the curriculum, it lets the kids see, hey, that's not fair. So that's the first step, but now what are we going to do about it? And one example would be when we wrote to our school board office asking them to use recycled paper within the school. So the kids did tons of research. We read a, um, an Aboriginal legend 
that predicted the end of the world if we didn't look after our earth. So the kids became really concerned. They decided their path, what they were going to do about it, and they were successful. So it's nice to see the kids take some community action and, and become um, activists within, within our school. Boards must provide religious accommodations to staff and students. Accommodations come in a variety of forms and respect the needs of students whether they come to a small rural school or to a large urban school. When a family or a student asks us for religious accommodation, then we certainly make arrangements. We don't assume beforehand. And a very simple accommodation that I can think of is in our high schools, to participate in physical education, you need to wear the school uniform. And typically the uniform is a t-shirt and shorts. Some of our Orthodox Muslim families, not all, because there's varying degrees of orthodoxy within each faith, will request that their children not participate in gym. And when we talk to them about why it is that they'd like their children not to participate, it has nothing to do with the prohibition on physical education. The prohibition is on showing skin. So some of the accommodations that we have made is we will have a long sleeve t-shirt, same logo on the front, but with long sleeves. And instead of wearing shorts, you can wear jogging pants. We've accommodated for their religious beliefs. Well, at the same time, the kids can participate in the curriculum. If we didn't take the time to ask what was the reason for the accommodation, the child would simply not participate in gym. So part of the process is to find out why they need the accommodation and how can we work together to meet the needs of the school system and meet the needs of the child without simply exempting the child so they're sitting on the stage. Our multicultural calendars, and these are distributed to each and every one of our schools. So in, during the morning announcements, whether you have children who are reflected of that particular diversity or not, I think as Canadian global citizens, it's very important for our students to know who's celebrating what and when. So many of our schools simply read these on the announcements every day, and it helps make our students aware of the rich diversity that exists, not only in our schools, but in our community around us. One of the things I think I started to do as a principal with my staff is stop and listen to what our community is telling us. So that meant hearing the different voices in the community, looking at the different needs of the population. We need to work with our community. I think it comes back to education. It's educating students and educating teachers on a whole student, understanding the intricacies, but also making students feel comfortable so they're willing to share their intricacies. We're not asking every teacher to understand every sect of every religion and understand every accommodation that anyone of any race may need. I feel strongly that the face of the Canadian student is changing dramatically. I love seeing um, children of different ethnic groups come forward and participate in the larger school community. I wanted to be a part of that in so many ways and the most easiest and accessible way was celebrating different celebrations throughout the school year and Diwali is something that I partake in because at the time of Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, all those events uh, are around the same time of the year. So that's something that I played a role in throughout my children's education was coming forward and sharing the parallels of the different celebrations that we do. I think we've also worked on inviting conversations with parents. We invite parents into the school to talk about what is it that you would like for your child because I don't believe that there's a better advocate for a child than for than their parent. Ontario's equity and inclusive education strategy is designed to promote fundamental human rights as described in the Ontario Human Rights Code and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, with which school boards are already required to comply. In addition, boards and schools must continue to uphold the standards set out in the Provincial Code of Conduct, in which respect for all is the overarching principle. School climate is defined as the sum total of the personal relationships within the school. Every person within a school community is entitled to experience a positive school climate, free from discrimination and harassment. When relationships founded in mutual respect are modeled by all, a culture of respect becomes the norm. A variety of school-led activities, 
teams, or clubs promote and encourage the understanding and development of healthy relationships. Co-curricular activities that offer students opportunities to achieve success outside the classroom can contribute to their engagement in learning and success inside the classroom. The inclusive classroom uh, gets ready for the child and not the other way around. Uh, f feelings of uh, belonging and enhance a student's uh, self-esteem and can contribute to their uh, academic success and uh, their, their success uh, behaviorally. Um, students who feel accepted are more likely uh, to do well in school. One of the things that we, we do at the school is to ensure that we empower staff to carry on and, and also ensure that the social justice equity is embedded in curriculum. Every staff member in the school is involved in one of the pillar teams and takes leadership and takes ownership to ensure that we stay true to the values of community excellence respect. And through that, um, we have over 60 clubs and teams and activities where staff not only make those connections with the kids throughout the classroom, but those special connections outside of the classroom that uh, makes a difference in young people's lives. Our kids are involved in local things in, in our community, and also they're involved in global activities. And that, again, is the empowerment we give to kids and the empowerment we give to staff. I think that bullying is something that equity really tries to deal with because, I mean, in school sometimes we have a sense that bullying isn't really brought to the forefront. You know, students aren't, um, they don't have the same awareness that they should have about it. Everyone has a specific initiative that they want pushed forward and then it's sifting through and finding what students care most about. And the more I talk to students, the more I find that what's really bothering students all across my board is bullying and how that affects equity and inclusion. Yeah. What the directive tries to do is make sure that all bullying is reported to the administration so that it can be dealt with properly and to have students involved in the solution of whatever the issue might have been. So I think that it really brings that issue to the forefront and it lets students know that this isn't something that's going to be ignored, this is something that's going to be reported on and that they're going to be involved in the solution process. La direction et tout le monde dans l'école est très sérieux à propos de l'intimidation ou les problèmes comme ça. Alors, comme j'ai dit avant, tu peux toujours aller voir n'importe qui et tout le monde est là pour toi quand tu le sais. Parce que dans l'école, même um, on, fait, on faisait des fois vers le Pacifique qui apprendre comment gérer les problèmes et tout ça. Alors, ils font des programmes pour ça qui aident beaucoup dans ces cas-là aussi. One of the things that we do to raise awareness for people of different sexual orientations, gay, um, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, is to actually understand what those words mean. And so once the students get past the giggling and the laughing, which is just their own personal comfort level with it, then we talk about what it really means, what it means to be gay. Well, it's not anything different than what it is to be straight or to be bisexual or to be transgendered. It's not a lifestyle, it is how people are. And it's just coming to accept that. You don't have to like it. It's just accepting it and understanding that there are different types of people. Just like people are short, people are tall, people have different sexual orientations. So mostly we just, we just talk. One of the things I'm involved with in the school is our Ambassadors Club, and that's something that is an initiative to, um, an anti-bullying initiative. And it's great because it gives the kids an opportunity to have positive power within the school, some leadership activities for both bullies and victims of bullies. So that's something that's been really great. Um, another thing that we do is the green team. So we care a lot about the earth and we recycle in the school. We have composting within the school and the kids are all responsible for looking after that. It's something they really take ownership of. Well, one of the things that I wanted to talk about that I think that is a unique sort of area of uh, equity and, and inclusion that is rarely talked about, I think, is choice of extracurriculars. And I think that equity and inclusion can be somewhat, um, it can be sullied when we have students that are mistreated because they're affiliated with certain things in the school. 
for example. They think that some students uh, feel a, lot, a lack of equity when they're involved in things like chess club or perhaps they're involved with uh, uh, Japanese animation groups or something like that. Uh, very often I think these are students, it's a population that unlike um, religious groups, which I think we're dealing with very well, I think these are just very social norms that we need to fix and help because I think quite often these students can be subject to bullying, these uh, students can be subject to mistreatment. One of the things that is often overlooked is that every single school, every classroom, every uh, board in Ontario is a very rich tapestry of students and staff and that in fact when we think of diversity we often tend to focus on if you will the more visible the more uh, the more obvious dimensions of diversity and while certainly absolutely critical to mine to tap to celebrate that richness there's diversity in absolutely every school community Changing individual and collective behavior, changing organizational and institutional practices can all help to build an education system that is equitable, inclusive, and free from discrimination. Boards can and do provide opportunities for all staff, administrators, and trustees to participate in training on topics such as anti-racism, anti-discrimination, and gender-based violence. Boards can and do provide information for students and parents to increase their knowledge and understanding of equity and inclusive education. Je crois que si les enseignants respectent nos élèves, nos élèves vont respecter aussi l'ensemble du personnel, non seulement les enseignants, mais nos secrétaires, nos concierges. Donc je crois que c'est vraiment important ici de, de faire en sorte que C'est un ensemble et on se respecte tous un et l'autre, peu importe la position où on est. Ça se vit dans l'école. C'est quelque chose qui se ressent. C'est quelque chose qu'on, on, quand on ouvre la porte, on se sent bien, on se sent chez nous. Alors c'est ce qui est, c'est ce qui est dégagé ici à l'école. Our board has been training volunteers for years. Um, in October, they get. The uh, staff who come in and train parents on how to read with students, how to do math with students, um, and uh, any, any types of things like that um, so that parents will feel more comfortable going into the school. Our board was very fortunate to have been one of the school boards in Ontario chosen for the Urban Aboriginal Education Project. And so they received a grant and part of that grant was to create the First Nations resource collection that every school received. And the teachers have been trained on uh, different lesson plans that go along with the First Nations resource collection. So there's different pieces within that collection that they can take, for example, um, a Métis sash and there's a lesson that goes along with it or multiple lessons. And I have about 10 teachers go to these sessions and learn about how to incorporate Aboriginal education, Aboriginal culture into the curriculum that they're teaching now. So we've seen some amazing results. And But in addition to that, we make sure we celebrate every different culture that we have in the school. We have something called Heritage Day put on by one of our education assistants every year where we celebrate every different uh, culture. We have many community partners who come in and present different uh, shows for us. Um, we have Scottish dancing and Ukrainian dancing and Italian dancing. And we just celebrate every culture that we, we possibly can think of for a full day. And we've had nothing but positive results with that. We have an annual powwow where we have our community partners come in, a variety of different dancers and drummers, and teach our students about the Aboriginal culture. And so the kids all sit in a big circle in the gym and the powwow and the dancing go, go on in the middle. And it's been an amazing process as well. I'm very proud in my board, as part of our new teacher induction program, we have a mandatory training program for all of our new teachers called A Teacher's Guide to Respecting Diversity in the Classroom, Diversity Matters. And there is a whole unit on ensuring that our teachers understand and recognize diversity. What we have done at our school board is acknowledge that teachers and students come from very different places. And we have put in together a training program for our staff to help them acknowledge and embrace the rich diversity that exists in their classroom. Being accountable and transparent means being able to demonstrate that principles of equity and inclusive education permeate all of the board's policies, programs, guidelines and practices. It means having mechanisms in place that involve you in open, accessible, and interactive communication about the work of equity and inclusive education 
with everyone in your entire school community. Students, teachers, parents, staff, school councils, community partners and volunteers. They need to know what your goals are and the progress you are making. This is a key part of increasing public confidence in the board and its schools. It would be really empowering to have students involved in what the school board is doing, the policy making process. I think that if students were given a sense that their voice matters, which is what the Ontario Student Trustees Association tries to promote through all of our work, I think that students would get a lot more involved in the process and would be able to voice their concerns and then the school boards would have an actual idea of what the issues are and what needs to be done about it. There has to be communication between parent council, between the representatives of the parents and the staff here. We need to know what their expectations are and I think that's happening. There are regular parent council meetings where the community voices their concerns, voices what they hope to see happening in the school to the principal and then the principal then communicates that to us. So there's, there's constant communication between staff, and parents and the community. It's important for an entire system, for an entire board, to, um, to understand why we're engaging our parents. Um, one of the things that I personally have found quite useful is to, in fact, embed the key messages, uh, the common understandings, uh, into many, many forums. For example, uh, to, to ensure that it's built into board policies, board vision statements that it's built into uh, the board's multi-year plan and that our, uh, that our teachers, that our principals and all our staff understand that it's a board-wide priority. It's not just something that is sort of left to chance. And in addition to that, to, uh, to, to deliver on the promise, it's absolutely critical for a board to support its staff, to give them assistance in, in knowing how to effectively engage their parents uh, from, from all communities and from all homes. How will we know the good work that we've done is paying off and, and how will we be able to evaluate that? I think there's a number of ways of looking at how we can evaluate that. One would be just what we do in terms of internal communication, uh, looking at the different activities and events that happen at the school level. We usually promote that uh, through various publications, uh, the director's bulletin, and things like that. Uh, every year we set goals and we set different um, guidelines in terms of knowing we're going to be successful. And I think every year reviewing that and evaluating that to see if we're actually meeting those guidelines and the criteria that we set, whether it's a three-year plan or a five-year plan, and ensuring that we're on track for that, um, I think will keep us, uh, keep us focused in terms of where we want to head. To put it very simply, the more often we can have the public and parents inside our buildings, uh, th the greater the chances are that we'll deliver on the promise of building public confidence. Um, all too often, uh, it's unfortunate that our public and our parents are really judging our schools by the isolated incidents that they may read about in the media, when in truth, you can't walk into a public school in Ontario and not um, come away feeling much better, not only about what's going on in our schools, but about the youth that are in those schools, and certainly the work that's going on every day. Writing about what's going on in our schools, publicizing what's going on in our schools, is effective to a certain degree, but there's nothing better than getting parents and grandparents and community members inside the walls of our schools. And then the myths of, of what they think might be happening in schools just dissipates uh, very quickly. Every school is diverse in many different ways and we really I think want our, our students in Ontario to be global learners and to be global citizens. As we know the world seems to be shrinking and shrinking you know with technology and social networking and so I think we do our, our students a real disservice if we don't make sure that the education we're giving them is reflective of, you know, the many different facets and viewpoints that the world can bring to them. When we talk about what's required to make our public school system the best that it can be, the challenge can seem so overwhelming, but I think it's far less daunting when we think about this one child at a time, and that's the way I think we should think about it. If one student or some students are getting lost in the system, then the system doesn't work. It has to work for every single child, and I believe that that's what inclusive education is all about.